everyone, Fred here from the CC Network, welcoming you to February 2016's Friday Flashback Review. And this time, for the first time, this series is going to venture into a Canadian pay-per-view offering. Today, looking at Backlash 2004. Now, this event was requested by James Slynn, a university friend of mine who is currently in the final semester of the same degree that I graduated with last year. I hope the work isn't too stressful for you, and hopefully you can relax. Watching slash listening to this should all be good. After WrestleMania 20, the WWE decided to shake things up a bit by throwing another draft lottery. The first, I believe, since the brand extension two years prior. And, of course, Raw got the better end of it than SmackDown and had a decent roster to boot. Would this help the first Raw pay-per-view of the calendar year be a success? Then again, it had Chris Benoit coming into his hometown as the newly crowned World Heavyweight Champion, as well as having a bitter rivalry finally getting resolved. It all looked like it had the potential to really wow. But could it? That is indeed the question we're going to find out in this review today. WWE Backlash 2004 took place on the 18th of April 2004 at Rexall Place in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, with 16,839 people selling out the place to see their hometown boy in action, of course. This was the first and so far only pay-per-view to be held in this arena, with a few Raw, SmackDown and ECW tapings happening in subsequent years. Eyes Wide Shot by Edgewater was the theme song, and while it didn't suit the event's promotional colours and stylings, completely, it was still a great song to headbang to. Well, at least for me, anyway. We start this event off with Shelton Benjamin taking on Evolution's tag team champion in Ric Flair. Shelton Benjamin was brought over to Raw in the aforementioned draft lottery and immediately got in Evolution's face, challenging Triple H to a match which he ended up winning. My god, a, a young guy beating Triple H? It must be the reverse of Burial Day or something. And thanks to Chris Benoit and Shawn Michaels, he won again. Quite incredible. Flair, feeling that it was a complete injustice that this young guy would be able to beat the former world champion, wanted to give this former All-American a taste of what happens when you mess with evolution. And thus came this match. And while Flair tried his best, he couldn't beat the young upstart, who defeated the legendary Nature Boy in 9 minutes and 29 seconds. Now, this match was a very solid affair, with Benjamin's cocky pace and Flair's in-ring prominence dominating proceedings. And while it did have fluid momentum shifts and equal bounce of offense, the pace fluctuated so much that it had a hard time trying to balance itself, which made the crowd quite indifferent the longer it went on. And while the match was made primarily to showcase Benjamin off, the crowd were more interested in Flair, which I've got to say was quite weird, because that meant that this match really couldn't do its job properly. But then again, I can give this Canadian crowd some slack. They probably haven't seen Ric Flair in a match there, probably since they were in WrestleMania 18 in the bloody Sky Dome. So they were willing to take it all in in their stride, but it didn't help the match at all. But I will give Benjamin and Flair credit for working the former's knee throughout, setting up the figure four, obviously, as well as Benjamin countering almost all of Flair's dirty tricks, showing that yes, even though you are a legend, I can still get you at your own game, which was lovely to see. And it was the main highlight in a match that went slightly too long and didn't retain attention for much of it. It's a solid one and a half star match, but it could have been much, much more than what it was. Sure, Benjamin got the win in the end and was made to look like a bigger fish in the pond than he was meant to be, but inevitably it could have been much better if he was against a guy who was of equal pace and honestly of better stature than Flair, because Flair's age was showing at this time and it just it, this match needed a better opponent and just a better structuring to really get it going but i'll give these guys credit for doing a good job with what they had Next, we have quite the strange matchup indeed pitting Tajiri against Jonathan Coachman. <laughs> yeah, I know, I can't believe it either. Anyway, like Shelton Benjamin, Tajiri was brought over to Raw via the draft lottery, and in Lara's stance, they decided to play a trick on Tajiri on his first proper night by telling him to spray whoever the hell walked through the door. And it turned out to be Jonathan Coachman, who, I have to admit, funnily overreacted with the green mist all over his face. And Lars Estance said to him, listen, you know, this is Eric Bischoff's boy. This is his right-hand man. You're in 
serious trouble here. And Tajiri went to go and apologize, but Coach exaggerated it, proclaiming, oh, this guy was horrible, he's a vindictive person, Ugh. And Bischoff decided to put Tajiri in a match against Kane as punishment, which backfired because Tajiri won using the mist. Lovely. And Coach hated that, so he cost Tajiri a match against Christian the following week. Coach then brought out Al Snow the next week dressed as a ninja, telling Tajiri that if he beats the five-star ninja, he can face Coach at Backlash. And of course, Tajiri wins easily, setting up this match. And while this looked like an easy win for the Japanese buzzsaw, Coach got the win. Yeah, it's hard to believe, thanks to an interfering Garrison Cade, who of course got split up from Mark Jindrak in that draft lottery, at 6 minutes and 26 seconds. Now, you'd be thinking, just by looking at who is in this match, and what it's all about, that this is probably going to be really, really awful. However, if you've seen this one, and you're looking at the ratings above, you'd be surprised at just how good this actually is. And the, re the reasons why are quite incredible, because Coach had a lot of offense. Not only did he actually have a lot of offense, he worked Tajiri's leg throughout the match, which made the psychology the focal point of it. And while the pace was incredibly slow outside of Tajiri's small rush at the end, seeing Coach deliver simple moves that many wouldn't expect from an announcer, and a former basketball player who has had no wrestling experience, I may add, was really great to see and made this match more entertaining because of it. And sure, the crowd didn't enjoy it though. So you know, I was I was sitting in my seat going, oh wow, this is actually quite impressive. And they were booing it, chanting boring all the time, but eh, I, I believe many of them probably expected Tajiri to go in and kill Coach quickly, which was disappointing for them. But then again, the Japanese buzzsaw nearly did take Coach's head off with a reverse tree of woe into a baseball slide, which really looked like it hurt. <laughs> but yeah, they really wanted to see the death of Coach, and it didn't happen. <laughs> and Coach did hold his own, but... I have to admit, I find it very disappointing that he held his own, but still needed interference to win. I mean, come on, the guy did all right. For a non-wrestler, why did he need a friend in there to help him? But uh, I, I think, honestly, he's a heel, so it's necessary for progression and necessary for a rematch down the line. This match was way better than I expected it to be, and if it wasn't for the psychology... Coach's moves and the momentum shifts along with the pace change in relation to the time it had, this wouldn't be getting a one and a half star rating that I'm giving it. And you know what? In similar re similar retrospect, I gave Striker vs. Mahoney at December to Dismember a one star rating because it entertained me as well as doing just enough to make it worth its time. This match did the exact same. And... I can't believe I'm saying this, but Jonathan Coachman actually ended up being in a match that wasn't totally awful. I can't believe it's actually happened. Well done, sir. Next, we have the first big match on the card, an all-Canadian super brawl, as Chris Jericho takes on Christian and Tristratus in a two-on-one handicap match. Now, Jericho and Christian had a friendship that was ended thanks to their affection of Trish, and it led to their famed WrestleMania 20 match against each other, which Christian won thanks to Trish turning on Jericho. Now, Stratus didn't think that Jericho cared for her, and in her opinion, he wasn't in her league. Jericho obviously retorted, implying that the former Babe of the Year was the pig of the same name, along with a myriad of other offensive remarks and slurs taking place on the highlight reel. Disgusted by Jericho's words, Christian told Trish afterwards that they would both get their revenge on Jericho in a handicap match at Backlash, with, in Christian's words, him doing most of the work. Jericho then further angered Stratus by costing her a women's title shot in a battle royal a week later, and after even more offensive highlight reel remarks, Christian and Trish got their revenge on Jericho in a raw sense, not a pay-per-view sense, after they assaulted Jericho during a women's match against Lita, hitting him with a chick kick and an unprettier. They were ready for this, but could Y2J overcome the odds? You'll be happy to know that he did, and he did so defeating the Canadian tandem in 11 minutes and 22 seconds. Now, this match could have been a slow, methodical affair, which would have killed the psychology completely. So thankfully, it had consistent pace, which allowed both Jericho and Christian to shift momentum frequently to ensure this match was not boring. 
Then again, that wasn't a problem as the crowd were behind Jericho throughout, so whenever he got offense, they went completely nuts. Which was beneficial because he had most of the offense, which meant that the crowd really didn't die down throughout this thing. Not to mention they were also chanting slut at Trish Stratus all the way through, as well as a call for asshole as well to Christian, because they really hated their own, you know? Anyway, Trish played her part in the match by driving the psychology from her interactions with both male participants, bringing drama and intensity to it all. I love that Christian and Trish highlighted on Raw that she would be allowed to get the pin off an unprettier to win it. And while it didn't get the win, it occurred in the match. And I've got to tell you, continuity is continuity regardless. It was a match overall, though... That got better as it went on, with Christian hitting a great second rope DDT and a Texas Cloverleaf to give some move variety through the match. But it needed overall to be higher to break this match into three-star territory. And while it was a fun match to watch, it wasn't the greatest in ring. But the story was told greatly, even though it ended on a very anticlimactic note with that Enziguri. And I felt it could have gone at least four minutes longer to reach a better conclusion, and it felt a little rushed as a result, which means it gets a two and three quarter star rating. And the thing is, it was a pretty solid and good match, actually. I quite enjoyed watching it. But like I said, if it was longer, it could have gotten better for it. And while Jericho and Trish's feud continued from here, it wouldn't be better than this one match was. Seriously, Tyson Tomko? Ugh, I don't even think we want to see that again, that's for sure. Next, we have the Women's Championship match, pitting the incumbent champion Victoria against Lita. Now, Victoria, fresh off her defeat of Molly Holly at WrestleMania 20, needed a new opponent for Backlash, to be decided by a battle royal. And Lita won it, thanks to the aforementioned Chris Jericho interference, to earn her spot in this match. Now... The thing is, <laughs> apart from a tag team match with Lita, the Raw after WrestleMania, which is the Raw before the draft lottery, two weeks before <laughs> this number one contendership battle Raw came through, Victoria wasn't present on Raw at all, appearing more often on Heat than on Raw, with Lita putting herself in, in this Jericho Trish feud to promote the match, and... That just says a lot of how WWE really didn't care much for the Divas at this time, for sure. Anyway, Victoria defeated her challenger in 7 minutes and 22 seconds to retain the WWE Women's Championship. Now, despite some fast pacing towards the end with Lita's offense getting a small pop, this match stunk. Big time. Now, you look at this match and you think, there are two consummate women's wrestlers here why are they not doing anything this match was apart from a very fast section at the end very sloppy very slow and it never really picked up and the crowd minus lita's briefest of offense never really cared and the possibilities for psychology were ignored or no sold completely i mean a surfboard stretch into the back and the working of the back lita didn't sell and not to mention victoria didn't go after the neck to set up the widow's peak on lita's surgically repaired neck i mean this is ridiculous. There are so many opportunities to make this match worth something, and it never got off the ground. It was just a complete train wreck, really. And honestly, this is as plain as zero as I've ever seen. Avoid this one at all costs, everyone. It is just not worth your time or mine having to review it. Now we've gotten that piece of crap out of the way, we can go on to something which is worth talking about. A match that everyone remembers. Randy Orton taking on Cactus Jack for the Intercontinental Championship in a hardcore match. Now, Orton had been mocking and abusing Foley for months, which culminated with Evolution defeating Foley and The Rock in a handicap match at WrestleMania 20, with Orton pinning the hardcore legend to rub his superiority in. Now, Foley, out for revenge, stated that Orton hadn't proven anything with that match because he hadn't been able to beat him by himself, and challenged the legend killer to a one-on-one -on -one match at Backlash, with Evolution banned from ringside and the Intercontinental title on the line, but under his terms. Foley 
Foley chose a hardcore match, which Orton accepted reluctantly. Then Foley cut that amazing promo. You know which one I'm talking about, the one with the rocking chair. And if you go check that out on YouTube or the network, it is worth it completely. If you have not seen it, please do. Where Foley talks about having to go back into the state of mind that he thought he'd left behind knowing that he'd have to give Orton the punishment he had deserved for all that he has done to him. He brought out his barbed wire baseball bat, Barbie, telling Orton that he really just didn't care what damage he would do to him, and he was going to rip, tear, and he was going to gorge, and maybe even love it, as Cactus Jack was announced to be the legend that Orton would have to take down to overcome what was at his time his greatest foe. Now, you know, after you've probably seen this match, this is a good one. So, you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go into detail for this bad boy. Foley goes right for Orton, who protects himself from Barbie with a trash can, drop toe-holding Foley onto the steps from that. Orton and Foley then have a test of strength to stop the bat from going into either one of their faces. Orton ducks out and whacks the trash can around Foley's head a number of times. Foley counters a fourth time and wraps it around a grounded Orton. Foley chokes Orton out back in the ring, hitting a face buster and a leg drop for two in the first pin attempt. A swinging net break on the outside is to be followed by a double axe, but Orton gets out and crawls up the ramp to escape. Foley then grabs Orton, who counters into a backdrop on said ramp, followed by a backslide pin and then a hair pull slam to said ramp again, with all three moves resulting in two counts. Foley is then slammed into the steps as Orton grabs Barbie, which Foley then stops going into his face, counting Orton with a low blow and a stiff clothesline. Foley then takes out Socko, which gets the crowd really rowdy and pumped up. Foley then picks up Barbie and then makes the fans choose which one they want. And obviously they're going to choose the baseball bat because they're sick bastards. Or as King would say, they're from Bizarro World, so of course they'd pick the most sick choice. Which Foley then wraps around the champion's face, busting Legend Killer open. A roaming elbow drop with the bat to the face does even more damage. And Foley then just beats the open wound furiously, followed up with a running knee. <laughs> and then he presses Barbie right across Orton's bloody face. And you think, oh, it couldn't get more violent than this. Oh, it does. Because Foley then places it around Orton's groin and hits a leg drop, driving that barbed wire baseball bat into Orton's testicles. Oh my god, it, it just hurts to watch it. And I don't give a damn because the crowd are going insane. So am I because it's such a sick spot. Nonetheless, Foley then decides to take it a step further because he's really that driven to kill the man by taking a gas can from under the ring and pours it on Barbie, ready to light it. But right as he does, Bischoff comes out proclaiming that if Foley lights it, not only would he lose the match, but the Fire Master would shut this event down, the fans wouldn't see the end of the night, they wouldn't see Benoit compete, you don't want to make them unhappy, Mick, so listen, put that down or you'll be in big trouble. And Foley somehow listens to reason because he cares about the fans and finds a cookie sheet to wrap that around Orton's skull instead. A nice replacement, I guess, but it's not fire though. Anyway, Foley then goes under the ring and finds the most incredible weapon you are ever going to see, a barbed wire covered board. Yeah which rightfully delivers a holy shit chant when nothing has happened, because honestly, that is incredible. Orton then counters a running clothesline by throwing chalk in Foley's eyes, and then back body dropping the hardcore legend onto the board. More holy shit chants come out as Orton covers, but only gets two. Orton then puts the board in the corner and throws Foley into it, this time with the shoulder eating it, and he is bleeding heavily from the arm as Orton grabs a cardboard box that he brought in a trash can earlier in the match. And uh, he took out of that a bag of thumbtacks. This match just gets more and more violent, and you can tell the fan and, and myself are loving it. The crowd are going crazy as Orton lines Foley up for an RKO. Foley counters it, throwing Orton back first onto the tacks, which stick out from his back, hand, and arm. Oh my god. I, years later, it never gets old, and the crowd are stunned. Fo <laughs> Foley rolls him up, 
<laughs> and Orton somehow kicks out of it. And I may remind you, Orton has these tacks in his back for crying out loud. He has been pressed into the ground with these things. Oh. Anyway, Orton tries to run, going through the gorilla position with Foley going right after him. They fight right through. And then to add more punishment to this insane match, Foley then chucks Orton off the stage through a board set up with wiring on it. The crowd are losing their minds here. <laughs> and the referees are checking on a Strinken legend killer. <laughs> who I again have to remind you landed through that table with the tacks in his back for God's sake. As Foley is pushed back by the referees. This match could be ended right here. But he doesn't give a damn. He punches the referees right in the face and delivers a running elbow off the stage onto Orton. And... More holy shit chants are coming. This Edmonton crowd are loving this. And I'm sitting at home wondering, this has been how many months worth of build? This is how you blow off a massive, bloody, aggressive and bitter feud like this. This is, oh, this is fantastic. Nonetheless, Foley covers and Orton kicks out. How the hell did he do it? Foley then takes Orton back into the ring, hits a double arm DDT and covers, but Orton kicks out again. Foley sets up the barbed wire board and goes for Orton, who hits him with Barbie through the ropes. He'd been kicked out of the ring at this point, and that's now busted Foley open. Several shots then follow, with Orton going for a headshot, but is then hit with the mandible claw, with Socko included. Orton then fights out with an uppercut and a low blow. Foley hits another mandible claw, this time without Socko, which Orton counters into an RKO. Orton covers, but Foley kicks out, and you're thinking at this point, what the hell are these two going to do to end this? They've been through so much here. Orton can't believe it, and he waits for Foley to get to his feet, and then he hits an RKO onto Barbie, face First, I'm not sure if it was more an RKO or a Bulldog, but you'll be the judge by watching it. Orton then covers and gets the three, retaining the WWE Intercontinental Championship after 23 minutes and 30, 30 seconds of hell. My God. <laughs> wow. This was a war. A bloody barbaric war. Many modern critics say that this is the standard for violent matches in WWE that hasn't been beaten since, and it's very easy to see why. Because the violence wasn't happening just because violence needed to be done, because of the story behind it, which had been built for many, many months, it just made this barbarism actually come through as sensible. And it made the story of this match fantastic as a result. It played out with great momentum shifts and pace, which when you combine that with an extremely hot crowd, it made this a marquee match that delivered in pretty much every way it could. It's a match that, for me, it's etched onto my memory, and I, I tell you, it is going to always replay in my head. But it won't get the highest of honours on my scale. Sure, the story and the crowd were perfect, and I enjoyed the living hell out of it. But the match, in my opinion, could have gone on a little longer to make sure that Orton had more of a chance to finalise his beating, rather than come with that rushed finish that we saw. And even with the moves that we got, it needed the fire. And it needed brawling in the crowd. It needed some anarchy to it. To really get over the line, move-wise, to have gotten this match into the heralded and unprecedented five-star territory. And it barely missed out on that, though. I will give this incredibly fantastic match the four and three quarter star rating that it bloody deserves. If you want to see a violent post attitude era match that delivers on pretty much everything, go see this. Check it out now on the network or on your DVD. It is worth every single second of the 23 minutes and three seconds that I got wrong earlier. I swear to God, you are not going to see a better violent match in WWE's library. Whew! After that insane match, the crowd and myself need to be calmed the hell down. So I bet you're wondering, what the hell does WWE have in mind to get us to, in layman's terms, shut the hell up? Well, 
they put the Hurricane and Rosie versus Larazi Stance in a tag team match. Because what else could they do? Now, I bet you're wondering, why is there a picture of Eugene holding a Divas magazine there instead of the match photo? But, yeah, you see... There wasn't any match photos to work with. Yeah, when I went and uh, got the photos for this video, there were none of this match to be seen anywhere. <laughs> Not to mention the fact that this match wasn't even announced in the build-up to the show. So, this is just being put on the card to fill time. <laughs> Annoyingly. But I will say this. What you see in the match photo slot on this visual thing you're looking at did actually happen on the event itself, so I can at least be beneficial there. Anyway, the Hurricane with his superhero in training, which still gets a good laugh, faced off against Larazi Stance's Sylvain Grenier in a singles match the week before the show, and Eugene, who had made his debut a few weeks prior, came down to the ring and tried to give the heel team an Easter Bunny plush toy because it was Easter the weekend before, and... Eugene was trying to be nice and kind, because he wouldn't know much else to do. Conway told him to get lost, and the bishop's nephew decided to give it to Grognier instead, who ripped the bunny's head off. That distraction allowed Hurricane to get the win. And, uh, yeah, that, this match got made from that. It seems pointless, doesn't it? I mean, what do the Hurricane and Rosie have to do in this point? Are they protecting Eugene to stand up to those bullies? Probably, but... Anyway, it's their duty, I guess. Onto the match itself, it was a short bout with Hurricane and Rosie defeating the French Canadians following Eugene's interference in 5 minutes and 22 seconds. Now, the entire match was a throwaway to set Eugene to come out, which did actually get a decent pop for it, I'll give that. Overall, the match had a steady pace and did get a little bit of a laugh out of me, but overall, the crowd didn't care. I did mention... <laughs> that they did pop a little, but that was more for knowing that Eugene was coming out rather than anything in the ring at all happening. And you obviously know my opinion on if the crowd doesn't care, I don't care, so we'll put that aside. But not only did the Edmonton crowd not care, but the commentators didn't either, focusing more on the aftermath of Foley versus Orton. Then again, I bet the crowd were as well, I can't blame them, that's why I mentioned it in the build-up to this match anyway. This is the definition of a throwaway match that was just put there for no real reason at all, and it is a big, fat zero. I can't really say any more than that, apart from this one fact. Am I right in saying that Eugene's name stems from the word eugenics and the ide ideology of eugenics? I will let you all discuss that with yourselves in the comments section, because that's a pretty good theory to throw out there. It was definitely more interesting to think about that than this match. Next, we have Kane taking on Edge, with this being the Toronto Natives' first match in 14 months. Pretty insane, right? Now, Edge was the second-to-last draft pick for Raw in the draft lottery, and he made his unexpected return on the same night, spearing the living hell out of Eric Bischoff. Seriously, go check it out on YouTube. It is quite glorious, especially with the way that his music syncs so well with the spear hitting. It's brilliant. Nonetheless, Bischoff was incensed by this and decided to put Edge in a match against Kane at Backlash because he can, he's the boss. And following the aforementioned loss to Tajiri that Kane suffered, Edge saved the Japanese buzzsaw from further punishment by spearing the Big Red Machine. Edge, however, didn't have it all his own way because during the build-up to this, he suffered a hand injury in training which allowed a cast to be put around his hand, which the, which the Rated R Superstar, or the soon-to-be Rated R Superstar, used to whack Kane with promptly after his match with Rhino. A week later, Johnny Nitro, yes, that Johnny Nitro from Eminem, came out to inform Edge that if he used the cast in the match, not only would he lose it straight away, but he would be suspended as well. Edge didn't give a damn, and he just speared the living hell out of Nitro, too. And it seemed, really, that Kane's just an afterthought in this thing. Like, seriously, after facing Taker at WrestleMania and losing... They just really wanted to find something for Kane to do, which is a bit depressing, if, if you were to say so myself. Anyway, Edge went on to defeat Kane with the cast, obviously behind the referee's back, and a spear in 6 minutes and 25 seconds. Now, one thing is made immediately clear to stand out from this match, right? 
<laughs> this should have been a proud moment, a Canadian homecoming for Edge. He hasn't been there for 14 months. Why? Oh, why? If I'd actually t think about it, last time was in bloody Montreal at No Way Out 2003. That was the last time Edge was in a WWE ring. Why the hell are the crowd not caring for this? They fell completely flat. Really? They didn't care one bit about him. They cared more about Earl Hebner being in there because they had a chance to chant, you screwed Brett. And then again, I think they had the right to not be interested because this match was dominated by Kane's slow offense. That being said, though, the match did get my enjoyment factor rising because Kane worked Edge's arm and his other arm, with Edge selling it well too. And like I said, the other arm, Edge used his one healthy hand to punch Kane, which is lovely. The use of that cast behind Hebner's back was turned and it made the story come through and it was nice to have a rounded conclusion for the match. But all in all, without that little bit of psychology boosting those two factors up, which is the psychology and my enjoyment, it saved this match from nosediving further because it really wasn't that good. It's not an offensive match, but it could have been a lot worse. And it also could have been a lot more too, but it's there for a one-star match and... Honestly, I really felt sorry for Edge here, but then again, it wouldn't be long before he rose to prominence as the rated R superstar that we all know today. It would take a few months, but then the crowd would really care for him. At last, we reach the main event. One that we all know just as much as the hardcore match. World Heavyweight Champion Chris Benoit taking on Triple H and Shawn Michaels in a triple threat match. A rematch from the main event of WrestleMania 20, billed as the final encounter between all three men. Now, of course, Benoit won the world title by making Triple H tap out at the grandest stage of them all. Michaels stated to Bischoff that while Triple H tapped out, Benoit had never beaten him in a one-on-one -on -one match. And Bischoff took that into account and actually set the match up between Benoit and Sean at Backlash. And at the draft lottery, Triple H was drafted to SmackDown in probably the best moment of the entire two-hour Raw, seemingly breaking up evolution. But alas, it wasn't to be, as the game was traded back to Raw by Kurt Angle for Booker T and the Dudley Boys a day later. On his return to Raw, Triple H demanded he get his chance at his world title and would want to get it back by facing Benoit at Backlash instead of HBK. And Bischoff said that his hands were tied because he'd already promised Michaels the match and the contract had already been signed. However, due to Triple H's rematch, he would make it a triple threat rematch from WrestleMania instead. Which of course led to Benoit and HBK getting involved with Evolution's business with Mick Foley and Shelton Benjamin to really get under the game's skin. And ensure that just like WrestleMania, those two would make sure that, that Triple H would be the underdog and that he would not walk out with the title at Backlash. And you all know what I'm going to do now. Go into detail for obvious reasons. Now, both men, Shawn Michaels and Benoit, do exactly that by double teaming the game out of the gate, leaving both HBK and Benoit to battle it out with alternating chops. Triple H gets back in and goes after Shawn, hitting the high knee before going after Benoit, who he throws to the outside before returning to his nemesis. Shawn takes Triple H down with an inverted atomic drop, but hits Benoit off the apron and continues the insult. Triple H counters setting up a pedigree, which HBK escapes from. Benoit is knocked off the apron again, this time by HBK, to a chorus of boos, but Benoit fights back with multiple German suplexes and chops, sending Triple H down. But Sean comes back at Benoit with more chops. Michaels is then sent flying back, first over the top rope, as Benoit then goes for the cross face on Triple H, letting go to knock HBK off the apron, and then going to the outside to throw Michaels into the barricade. Triple H gets Benoit off the top, onto the top rope, which Benoit fights out with headbutts as a Let's Go Benoit chant rings out. Triple H fights back with headbutts of his own, lining up a superplex, with Sean coming in and knocking Benoit off the top rope right to the outside face first. He then hits an electric chair drop on Triple H, covering for two in the first pinfall attempt of the match. Triple H and Sean are then knocked down after the patented face buster. Benoit goes to the top rope and hits Michaels with his patented swan dive headbutt. He covers, but Triple H breaks up the fall. Triple H is thrown out as once again, Sean and Benoit fight it out. Benoit ducks the flying forearm, which takes Kyoda. 
completely out. Benoit knocks Sean out, and he then walks into a pedigree, which Benoit then counters, trying to lock in a sharpshooter, but Triple H then fights out. But Benoit then locks it in properly to humongous cheers. Sean then tries to break it, but Michaels gets locked in the crossface just as soon as he tries. Benoit then goes out for Kyoda, saying, Come on, come on, I've made this guy tap already. But he's still out. Sean then locks in the sharpshooter on Benoit. And then Earl Hebner comes out. The booze completely overshadow everything. The crowd are absolutely venting. Are we about to see the Edmonton screw job? Alas, we are not, because Triple H breaks up the submission, much to the crowd's relief. Sean rolls Benoit into a small package and gets two off it. The you screwed Brett, Brett chants are just ringing louder and louder, knowing that Hebner is in there. And Sean is distracted by it as Benoit counters a lift into a crossface. Triple H then breaks it again, because he can. Triple H and Benoit then brawl before it's broken up by a sick-looking DDT for two. Triple H now joins the Chop Club right as the Edmonton crowd then start chanting, You tapped out, which irritates him and adds more to the story because they can, allowing Benoit to fight back and switch momentum and throw him out of the ring. Benoit tries to lock in a German suplex on Sean, but Sean counters with a clothesline and covers for two. The you screwed Brett chants are just back again as both men lay beats on each other, and with more chops included because they can as Benoit is then thrown out. Michaels then goes up to the top turnbuckle as the crowd are chanting at him. You can see the displeasure on his face. He goes for the crossbody, going completely over his two opponents, right into and through the announce table. Benoit looks at Michaels, and he's then thrown head first into the post and the steps by Triple H for his troubles. Benoit's shoulder is then put through two ring posts as the pace slows right down after nearly 20 minutes of fast action. Benoit sells the shoulder well as Triple H is greeted by an asshole chant by this partisan crowd. And then, of course, being the heel that he is, the game locks in a camel clutch, which is great pandering to the wrestling fans who know that's a heel move out there. The crowd loudly chant for Benoit as Triple H beats him down in the corner. Benoit then goes under and drops the game headfirst on the turnbuckle. Benoit is then hit by the face buster but counters a whip for the triple Germans, which connects. Benoit then slits the throat, signaling the giant headbutt. He then slaps Triple H on the ground as he goes up to the turnbuckle. He goes for it and misses. Oh yes, he did. Triple H then picks Benoit up and nails a pedigree. He crawls to cover Benoit and gets a two as Shawn Michaels comes out of nowhere to break the count. This match is quite awesome. It's now down to the two rivals, the heated rivals, Triple H and Shawn Michaels. They reignite their rivalry as they lay punches into each other. Michaels hits the forearm correctly and kips up to another chorus of boos, lining up for his elbow drop, which he connects. Michaels then lines up ready for sweet chin music with even more boos ringing out as he tunes up the band. Benoit goes on the apron and eats a sweet chin music, allowing for even more boos and for Triple H to hit a low blow on Sean. He covers, but Michaels kicks out at two. Triple H lines up another pedigree, but Michaels back body drops him over the top rope. Triple H goes under the ring and finds his sledgehammer, nailing Sean right in the back, letting the crowd let off their steam and cheer for once. Triple H goes for one final swing, but Benoit stops him. However, before the rabid Wolverine could fight back, he's then slammed onto the steps head first on the outside. Triple H then lines up. <laughs> oh God almighty, this match is so good. He lines up the bottom set of steps, ready to hit a pedigree on it. And of course, that would mess up Benoit's already messed up face. Benoit counters it and catapults the game into the steel post, which sends him into the timekeeper's area and the crowd. Benoit crawls back into the ring as Triple H, Triple H, Sean, lines up Sweet Chin music. Benoit counters it and locks in the sharpshooter. The crowd are loving it. They want vengeance for Brett. And Michaels is writhing in pain, trying to get to the ropes. But Benoit drags him to the center of the ring. Michaels taps out just as Triple H gets back in the ring. Benoit retains the World Heavyweight Championship in his hometown after a 30 minute and 8 second endurance test to last the ages. And really, what more can I say really about this match? 
it's not as good as the WrestleMania one, but my god, it comes close. Very close indeed. This match had a much louder and different crowd reaction, as well as different psychological elements that allow me to separate the two and, in my own eyes, put them on equal footing. While it didn't have the move variety the original had, it got everything else pretty much bang on the money. Both matches are fantastic, story-driven wrestling clinics, and in my opinion, they're both so good that they both deserve a 5-star rating. Some of you may not agree, but like the original, I was enthralled by what all three of these men did here. It could have it could have just been a carbon copy of the original and fallen completely flat, because it wouldn't have been the same. But they made it different enough to where it became its own entity, and for a rematch, to do that, and match the original, which only happened a month earlier, mind you, is impressive. And because I'm impressed... It explains the five-star rating thusly. Now, on to my final thoughts. Backlash 2004 comes across as a two-match card on paper, and while it looks like it, it's a card that, for the most part, surprised as much as it did underwhelming me. Now, with two perfect or near-perfect matches of such high quality stemming from this card, the two zeros that this show gave can really actually be ignored. But when you look at the rest of the card from a glance, it's below average in most cases, while still offering some decent moments in between. In the case of the handicap match, it provided a lot of fun, with some dramatic elements too. Coach proved he could handle basic wrestling and psychology, and it was the highlight of the night on that regard. Because honestly, who expected it? Overall, this event may only be remembered for two matches that took all the thunder away from the rest of the card, but when you watch this event only in those two zero-rated matches out of the eight, does this event feel underwhelming? Which isn't really bad, considering this is the first event following a successful and quite acclaimed WrestleMania. For the Raw brand to do that so soon after the brand reshuffle is good to see, as it laid a decent benchmark for the brand for the year ahead. It wasn't the greatest show ever, but it was definitely worth my time, so hopefully you'll feel the same if you haven't watched it already. Backlash 2004 gets a 6.5 out of 10, and that's a pretty good score, I've got to say. So, we've had two good shows reviewed in consecutive months. That's not bad at all. Let's hope that the pick that I have for March can continue this role. There we go, guys. Another Friday flashback in the can. And I know it's gone over 40 minutes again. I apologize. But when you've got two pretty much perfect matches to talk about and go through, you're going to do that. You're going to have to waffle on to get these things done. But nonetheless, what did you all think of this event? Do you agree with my ratings? Do you find some problem? Do you think I'm completely wrong? Then put your comments down there in the comment section and I would be greatly appreciative. Also, if you want to see the next Friday flashback review coming in March, along with Rider Goes Over, my WWE 2K16 video series, as well as any wrestling reviews that stem from that, along with a myriad of other things, because this is a network after all, click that subscribe button and you will not miss a thing. Not to mention it's completely free, like you need any reminding, but I would greatly appreciate that as well. Now, i am point this out in the description below as well, there will be no Fastlane review done on this channel next week, because I have a lot of work commitments I need to prepare for, and I will be not able to record it, edit it, export it, and upload it in the time I have after the event. So, the only way you're going to be able to check out any Fastlane coverage I do will be on the blog down in the description as well, where the review will be at least a day after the show. So, hopefully that'll be good because you won't be ending a review that's all i'm gonna say there but nonetheless everybody i look forward to march whatever the event will be where hopefully it'll be just as good as the two i've seen in the last two months hopefully it'll all work out i have been freddie thomas you've been people listening this has been a friday flashback wrestling review for the cc network and i will see you all next time cheers